All right, here we go. It's cardiovascular pathology day today. We'll do pulmonary toward the end of this quarter. It is winter of 2022. It's week three. It's Thursday. Here we go. So where have we been? Last time we were talking about diseases of lymph vessels. And we said lymphangiitis occurs when you get... Get my drawing tools out here. Let's say you get a bug bite or you get some injury right here and bugs get into your lymph system and the bugs can multiply as they head for the lymph node. But if it's an aggressive bug, it can actually go through the wall of the lymph vessel and get into the skin and uh, cause an inflammation of the skin which is visible is erythema red and when you see that that's lymph angiitis angi is a vessel inflammation is itis and lymph is lymph notice it's heading right for the lymph nodes which are going to catch those bugs and that's where we're going next all right and yep that's what happens the bugs will then move into the lymph node themselves so here's an injury to the skin here let's say this is the skin here we got a break in the skin the bugs got in to the interstitium they didn't get into the lymph capillary in this case but they went right or they didn't get into the regular capillary system but they did get into the lymph capillary and now they're headed for the lymph node and now they're in the lymph node and there's a big inflammation in here and it all depends how powerful your immune system is if your immune system kicks their butts well they're not going to get out of the lymph node but if they're very powerful like if it's MRSA um, it'll go right out of the lymph node and can get into your skin again and so the skin around the lymph node can become inflamed as well all right and that's called lymph adenitis if it gets into the skin if it doesn't get into the skin but the lymph node gets big that's called lymph adenopathy mm -hmm. and i don't know what you are currently the only person in this conference uh okay i don't know what virtual classroom is going crazy uh, but I got this double recorded, so we'll keep on going. So everything I said, when the lymph nodes become, when a, an infl inflammatory war occurs in the lymph nodes, um, they can become visible, like this YouTube singing sensation. I happen to do this, and I go, oh, she's got lymphadenopathy here. It can be from other things as well. But notice the skin is not red okay so that's not lymph adenitis it's lymph adenopathy all right and then as i said if the if the bug is powerful and it breaks out of the lymph node and into the skin then it's called lymph adenitis so here's an example of the posterior nodes and the preauricular nodes that have been invaded by a powerful bacteria and they have broken loose out of the lymph node itself and gotten into the skin so this is not lymph adenopathy this is lymph adenitis lymph adenitis because the skin is red make sure i almost guarantee you those are going to be on the test so make sure you know that another example of lymph adenitis here uh, there's the tonsillar lymph node um, that has been blown right through by the bug. And does that mean her her immune system isn't very powerful? It's possible. It's possible it should be checked after she recovers from this. Then what happens? Well, if the if the bacteria keeps right on going through the lymph node and through the lymph system, it can ultimately get into the bloodstream. And if it gets into the bloodstream, very dangerous situation. That's called septicemia. Some call it bacteremia when it first gets in there, but it, and if it 
gets worse, it becomes septicemia. Some say bacteriemia is an AKA for septicemia. Septicemia is the big one you're going to hear. So bacteriemia, some authors say it occurs when a little bit of bacteria get into the blood, but it's not enough to cause a fever or any symptoms. And your body's immune system may may take care of it, and you never even know you have it. Or maybe you think you got a bug or something, a little bit sick, and you get over it. Typically, these people are asymptomatic. But if the bacteria keep multiplying while they're in the bloodstream, you start getting sick, and then you're said to have septicemia, or blood poisoning, or sepsis. These are all AKAs. So, um, And here's just a cartoon. There's a red blood cell. These are all bacteria mixed in with the flowing red blood cells. And what they don't show is these bacteria can stick to the walls of the endothelium and irritate the endothelial cells. And what do endo irritated endothelial cells do? They stop making the slippery three, and they overproduce von Willebrand factor. And so you, you, be, you get into a prothrombogenic state when you have septicemia, right? Because they can stick everywhere. And that can happen in the blood, blood vessels throughout your body and happen inside of organs as well. This is a medical emergency. You're going to be hospitalized for this. It's so serious. And yeah, um, the, the bugs floating through can also be attacked while they're inside the blood by white blood cells, start attacking the bloodborne bugs. Um, and that stimulates the release of nitric oxide in cytokines from those white blood cells. We won't get into the specifics. Nitric oxide uh, will go into the arterioles and vessels and stimulate them to relax. And so you get a open, uh, the diameter of all the arterioles and venules opens way up throughout the body. And we know that causes a, that vasodilation causes a major drop in blood pressure. So some of these people die right away from hypovolemic shock because their blood pressure is too low. And they start to have a general swelling all over their body. If that's not bad enough, if you open up all the arterioles, there's nothing to control the flow of blood into the sensitive capillaries. And they get overpressurized and too much blood fluid squeezes out, which further causes the, the blood pressure to drop. Right, and plus it causes it starts to cause ischemia. We talk, remember the little fish diagram where you have so many water molecules in the interstitium that you can't feed the cells anymore, and you start to get a widespread ischemia of organs and in all the tissue of the body. And if that's not enough, the cytokines cause the endothelial cells, which are already on strike, they're not making the slippery three, and they're overproducing von Willebrand factor. And they shrink, and the shrinking leaves a big gap between them. There's no gap junctions anymore, or there's no um, tight junctions get pulled apart. And so now you leak even more. So general swelling occurs, blood pressure. By this point, you're probably about dead uh, from hypovolemic shock. Uh, and if that's not enough for you, those darn white blood cells uh, release... Uh, some of the radical oxygen species uh, that we've talked about, and they release cytokines, and we talked about how deadly they are as well. They stimulate the process of thrombosis and further leakage. So it's just a wicked uh, type disease. Everything I kind of said here, uh, the von Willebrand factor is released from the irritated endothelial cells, and that's going to make uh, thrombus everywhere in the body. You're going to have blood clots everywhere in the mic, in the lungs, in the kidneys, in the liver, just everywhere. And you can start getting chunks of that thrombus broke loose. So you're going to get these little emboli flying everywhere in the body. So not a good type of disease. How do you know when you have septicemia and you're in the hospital? Patients will be confused. The brain is hypoxic. Um, Typically, early on, you have a very high white cell count, but later on in the disease process, it can give up and you can have a low white cell count. Uh, fever, at the beginning and at the end, you can actually have kind of a hypothermia because, this, um, because the skin starts to be shut off because of the hypotension. We've talked about that mechanism. 
the heart's beating like crazy and you're breathing rapidly to try to combat the hypotension. Um, that's how you know. And fluid resuscitation, you're getting IV, uh, IV fluid and it's not bringing the blood pressure back up. And the catecholamines, they can give you norepinephrine and, epi and, and epinephrine to try to stimulate the tunica media of the arterioles to contract, to, to boost up the blood pressure. But that doesn't work either. Uh, and so blood pressure eventually bottoms out and you die. Hypovolemic shock, specifically we could call it septic shock because we know the cause. Not a good disease. There's about 700,000 cases annually. Some fun facts here. It's the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. Is the leading cause of death in patients who are critically ill in the hospital. About 210,000 die each year in the hospital of septicemia. Uh, mortality rates for contracting or for developing septicemia is about 30%. Uh, for people who are in the hospital. So it's very similar to deep vein thrombosis. And if you go into septic shock, it's over 60-70% of people will die. It's, it's a really bad disease or condition. Um, even if they resuscitate your blood pressure and they get that working, um, people commonly develop pneumonia from this from the bugs taking root in the microcirculation of the lungs, um, and you get ARDS, just like we talked about with SARS-CoV-2. It can get into the bones, you can get osteomyelitis, it can get into the liver and kidneys, it can get into the CNS, you can get meningitis, encephalitis. Um, so that, if the hypotension doesn't kill you, these other things can kill you. What is the treatment for septicemia? It's in the hospital, IV antibiotics, and fluid resuscitation. Um, if a piece of your liver dies and becomes pus-filled, um, that needs to be removed. So you might need some surgical processes to clean up the dead tissue in the body. All right, let's go back to lymph vessel disease, a condition known as peau de range, which I believe is French for orange. And let's see what that's about. So podirange typically means you have breast cancer. And it's a phenomenon early medical doctors noticed where the breast started to take on the characteristics of an orange. You know how an orange has big giant pores and looks like you have a magnifying glass look at it. Um, and it kind of looks like that. We'll look at some here in a second. Um, so yeah, so if a patient gets breast cancer and it metastasizes and fills the lymphatic system up, well, you get a beaver dam and you, you get a beaver dam and you back up and you get an interstitial fluid overload in the breast and the breast gets big from all that interstitial fluid backup. And you get it, can get ischemia and inflammation from the stress of the cells not getting enough oxygen because oxygen and nutrients can't swim through all those extra H2O molecules. Here is the, the lymphatic system of the breast. So just imagine you get, some, you get a cancerous tumor down here, let's say, and the cancerous tumor gets loose into the blood vessels and the, the cancer gets stuck in the lymph nodes and starts to grow in the lymph nodes. Maybe it gets over this way as well. And it blocks these lymph nodes. And that's how the woman notices it, right? She's in the shower doing her breast exam as all of you should be doing with soap. She feels a couple lumps under there. She doesn't think anything of it, but you get a lymph backup through this system and the whole breast starts becoming inflamed and full of edema because we can't get through the beaver dam there and get the lymph drained as it normally does. You know, eventually goes back into the venous circulation around the kind of around the subclavian vein where it meets the jugular vein, common jugular. Um, but yeah, that's the story, and you get all these weird 
appearances of the breast. So everything I said, lymphedema, uh, triggers swelling, ischemia, fibrosis, even fatty infiltration stimulates fibroblasts and does some strange things. And it makes the breast thick, rough, uh, and red sometimes from the inflammation. And that's called poderange. So let's look at a couple of these cases here. So this is not a normal breast. The nipple is retracted. That's always a bad sign. can be normal in some people, but if that happens out of the blue, that needs to be checked immediately. You could have breast cancer. But see how it, the orange looks like a breast? It, it's all the swelling of the breast kind of sucks in the skin pores and makes it look uh, like it's under a magnet. It's almost like lichenification, which we'll talk about when we get in seventh quarter. Here's another nipple retracted, and you can see the inflammation. Um, you can't see the, well, you can kind of see the little pits from the enswelling, but you can see the redness here. Um, and here's another one, um, that nipple retracted, and you can see slight redness in this African-American. Not a good thing. Examples of pote range. Right? So you need to get treated for breast cancer, and we won't go down that rabbit hole. All right. Let's change gears now. We are done talking about diseases of the lymph system. Um, let's talk about two common causes of arterial insufficiency. So that means these are diseases that clog up not the veins but the artery pipes and can result in downstream ischemia. Cold hands, cold feet, uh, dead tissue in the hands and feet as it gets severe, both of these. The first one is called Berger's disease, uh, thromboangiitis obliterans. That, oh, some of you are going, Burgers, where have I heard that before? Yeah, there's a Burgers test, uh, which you can use to test for this. You can use that to test for all types of arterial insufficiency. Uh, but here it is. So Burgers disease is an inflammatory disease, and it affects small and medium-sized arteries, especially in the forearms and the calves and the legs, not so much in the arms and thighs, but the forearms and the legs usually get affected. Those are perfect size vessels. Uh, and it's the inflammation is thought to be driven by an autoimmune attack, your body attacking the endothelial cells of these small to medium sized arteries. The question is what triggers it? And it's thought to be triggered by cigarette smoke particles. So these patients are almost always smokers. And we've talked about this for, before, but in people who are susceptible, some, some biomolecule in cigarette smoke gets into the bloodstream, circulates around, finds these small to medium-sized arteries, like the radial artery or the ulnar artery or the posterior tibial artery, the anterior tibial artery, the peroneal artery are perfect sizes. It gets in the endothelial cells and it the particle gets into the nucleus of that cell and it wakes up genes, maybe ancient genes, that were never ever supposed to be turned on. But now they're turned on and now the body's immune system doesn't recognize these cells. The endothelial cells die and are replaced. But if the genes are now manipulated, you're going to have this mutant form of endothelial cell. And the body takes a look at it and says, I don't know who you are anymore. You're foreign. Let's attack you. So that is the, the theory of Berger's disease. It's an autoimmune attack because cigarette smoke particles have manipulated the genes in the endothelial cells uh, into a new phenotype is the word, phenotype, but a new look. And that's pretty much, I just went through a lot of slides. Um, but yeah, so it, it likes these arteries. We mentioned every one of these arteries. I forgot the interosseous artery in the, uh, in the forearm. And it's ex almost 99% of this condition occurs in smokers, loves the arms, or loves the legs and forearms. And it is the inflammation in these vessels from the autoimmune attack causes a narrowing of the lumen 
um, and there goes your blood flow. You got a beaver dam. And so you have downstream ischemia and you have arterial insufficiency. And so we can test for that, right? I kind of double put this. We'll talk about these tests in a minute, but we can test for that. We'll save that. I could have taken that out. Um, some fun facts. Typically, this is a bilateral condition. Uh, so it's in the right and left arm at the same side. Here's the test question I always trip you up on because you think everything is caused by arterial sclerosis or atherosclerosis, which is a division, one type of arterial sclerosis. This has nothing to do with arterial sclerosis. This is autoimmune. Okay, so this is not peripheral artery disease doesn't affect this. Peripheral artery disease, or PAD, affects the bigger vessels, which we're going to talk about right after this. Some authors call this thromboangiitis, obliterans, an arteritis, an end arteritis, or a, vas a form of vasculitis. Um, some fun facts. Um, again, heavy smokers get this, especially men. Uh, it usually pops up in about the 30s, so it's fairly, it's not an old age type person disease. Much more prevalence in the Mediterranean regions, the Middle East and Asia, where smoking rates are much higher than they are in the States and in the West. And the sequelae, we talked about all this. If you pinch off the pipe, pipes of the forearms, how are your hands going to like that? How is the interstitial tissue going to like that? It's not going to like that. You get a downstream ischemia. Um, in your legs, you get claudication. When you go for a walk, you start getting cramping because there's not enough blood flow uh, to the muscles of your feet. You get cramps in your feet and your calves. Um, and that's called vascular intermittent claudication. Not to be confused with neurogenic intermittent claudication, which is from a pinching of the vessels around the thecal sac. I took all that out of there. You'll get that. I have YouTube videos on that, but I just cut that nick out of there. You'll get that in somewhere down the road. General uh, downstream tissue pain from the ischemia, necrosis, skin changes. I mean, ultimately, you can develop gangrene uh, if you go through this process. And then you're going to have to have an amputation. So here's a person with Berger's disease who just couldn't quit smoking. And he had it in his uh, all the medium-sized vessels in the legs. And here's the effect of it. So this you can get septicemia from this. This has to be taken out. Some more fun facts. The prevalence is decreasing as in the West, probably from a decrease in smoking. And the use of raw tobacco has been associated with this as well. Uh, the world population prevalence of this is still 3%. So that's, I mean, it's still rare, but it's not crazy rare. Uh, in India, for example, uh, one study found it the prevalence to be 50% of the population because every I guess everybody smokes over there, or at least they used to. Um, so related to, to smoking. Uh, what about Raynaud's? We'll talk about Raynaud's disease next time. Uh, Raynaud's affects the smaller arteries uh, and even sm it can there can be some overlap uh, because Berger's likes the medium and small arteries. Raynaud's likes the small and really small arteries, uh, so that's one difference. Uh, but Raynaud's is a temporary phenomenon in 98% of the cases. Um, it hurts like heck when it happens, but it lets go. Berger's disease is not. It's a permanent condition. There's, there is, for the inflammation ends in scar tissue formation. Uh, and it permanently narrows the lumen of blood vessels. So there's no fix for it. So Berger's disease is permanent where Raynaud's is not permanent usually. Clinical testing. Well, if, you, if the pipes in your legs, if the arterial pipes in your legs are all clogged up, you're going to get not a great blood flow to your foot. Uh, and therefore, your dorsalis pedis pulse and your posterior tibia pulse are going to be absent or very, very thready, very weak. You can do these tests in the legs, a Berger's test we talked about in lab and capillary refill test. You can do it on your toes just like you can on your fingernails. Can you use your toenails? 
those tests are going to be positive for lack of blood flow. If you're up in the arms, you can do capillary refill test in the hands, uh, and you can do Allen's test, which we talked about in lab as well. There's another test with really good sensitivity and specificity, 98% oh, sensitivity and specificity, and it's called the ankle brachial index test. And what it is, you can do this in your office, you need one of these little Doppler ultrasound machines, under $1,000 nowadays, and you f simply find systole, uh, systolic pressure in the arm, just like you know how to do already. Instead of using your fingers, use a Doppler ultrasound to detect systole. And then you detect systole down here uh, in the posterior tibial artery um, or the dorsalis pedis artery. And then you take those two measures and put ankle pressure over arm pressure, and that'll give you a number. And if that number is under 0 0.90, you have arterial insufficiency. And most of these people will be down in the 0.6s and 0.7s. Uh, so that means the artery pipes are clogged. Make sure you know that. I used to do this in lab, and we just don't have enough time uh, to do all this anymore. Uh, but that's an important uh, little trick you can use to see how the blood flow is. Uh, what about the treatment? What about stopping smoking? Uh, the research says if you catch it really early, if you if you do this test and maybe you're uh, 0.85 in this test, and you're a heavy smoker uh, and you're suspected of having Berger's disease, if you stop smoking, completely stop and stay away from cigarette smoke because you're sensitive to it, um, it may stop the progression of the disease, which is great, and it may even reverse. There's some evidence. Um, so that's good. Um, I think that our Rubens and Robins don't say it reverses, but it says it can stop the further progression. If there's scar tissue in there, it's pretty hard to understand how it gets better. But it won't progress to the point you need to have your foot amputated or your hand amputated. However, if the disease is well established and you're already are getting pain and skin changes, it's it's too late. You're going to need some type of surgery to revascularize uh, the hand or foot. Um, there is another treatment you can do uh, called a sympathectomy. Remember the cervical and lumbar sympathetic chain. Uh, those sympathetic nerves run down. Uh, and they, that's how the sympathetic flow gets to the tunica media vessels. Well, it gets to the tunica adventitia, and then norepinephrine gets down to the tunica media. But remember, sympathetic flow causes a vasoconstriction. If your, ve if your vessels are already narrowed and, and you want to open them up, you can cut off the sympathetic flow to them, and they'll naturally open up. And so you could cut the sympathetic chain, but if you cut the sympathetic chain... You're, there are some complications uh, because without sympathetics, you're not going to have any sweating. You won't be able to sweat in your entire lower extremity. Let's use the lower extremity. Um, your vessels that are not affected uh, by narrowing are going to be way too wide. So you're going to have swelling and edema and erythema in those vessels. Uh, so it's kind of a kind of a trade-off, and it's permanent. You can't fix it. I would probably try some revascular revascularization surgery before trying this because that's a permanent thing. This looks like Raynaud's, an attack of Raynaud's disease, um, but it's not. It's there all the time in a smoker, heavy smoker. And you can see there's already skin changes here in the fingers uh, where this has occurred. So this is not, this is Berger's disease or thromboangiitis obliterans. All right, I said we're going to talk about another cause of arterial insufficiency, another clogger of the pipes, of the arterial pipes, and this is PAD, peripheral arterial disease. And yes, Homer's banging his head, dope. There's too many AKAs, and you think we could get all the world leaders in vascular surgeons together and say, and authors of pathology books and say, this is the term we're going to use, but of course we can't do that. So these are all AKAs for peripheral arterial disease. The big one is peripheral vascular disease, 
Um, the, even Robbins flips these two within the same book. Um, so you got to know peripheral vascular disease. PVD is an AKA or PAD. Um, aortic iliac disease is another one. Uh, arteriosclerosis obliterans is another one. They're not going to, or atherosclerosis obliterans. That'd be great if they use those for a board question because it tells you what the problem is, and it's arterial sclerosis. So definitely no peripheral vascular disease uh, and maybe arterial sclerosis obliterans and definitely aortic iliac disease. should know those. Um, and it is another arterial insufficiency. And this one is caused by an occlusion not of the small and medium-sized vessels, but it's an occlusion of the larger blood vessels, like the favorite place, the abdominal aorta, uh, the iliac, the external and iliac, the external and internal iliac arteries, maybe even the common femoral artery. It's not going to go down usually into the popliteal arteries or the smaller arteries of the uh, of the legs. So that's the big difference between it and Berger's disease. It targets those bigger blood vessels. Let's not forget who these targets are. So there's the abdominal aorta. There's the important renal arteries we've been talking so much about. And the abdominal aorta splits into a common iliac artery that splits into an internal iliac artery and an external iliac artery once you go under the inguinal ligament you become the common femoral artery and then we talked about the common splits into a deep femoral artery and the regular femoral artery okay um, so what is PAD caused from? Is it from smoking? It is not a smoker's disease. This one is caused from arterial sclerosis. More specifically, what type of arterial sclerosis? It's usually atherosclerosis that is the main culprit here. The other two members of arterial sclerosis family is arteriolosclerosis, olosclerosis and Monkberg's medial sclerosis can certainly contribute. It's probably a mix of all three. Uh, so the, but so you should be aware uh, that the question could say any of these could cause it. Um, there's another condition that super rarely causes it that we'll just take a peek at. I think we'll start that next lecture though. Uh, but yeah, so really PAD is just the sequelae or the result of atherosclerosis. That's true. And so, is it inflammatory disease? Yes, it is, because atherosclerosis is an inflammation. Uh, we've talked about the mechanism. If we haven't, we will. I can't remember if we did or not. Uh, but it is inflammatory disease. Burgers has nothing to do with arterial sclerosis. Burgers is an inflammation inflammatory disease which is stimulated by an autoimmune attack of mutated endothelial cells. Um, remember the arterial arteriosclerosis family? So um, we have arteriolosclerosis. It's a narrowing of the arteries for vessel. You should remember this from histology. Uh, atherosclerosis and Monkberg's medial sclerosis. This is the one that calcifies arteries. You can see on x-ray sometime because of Monkberg's. Favorite target is the abdominal aorta uh, and the iliac arteries. That's why one of the AKs is aortoiliac disease. And here's a 3D CD reconstruction, a 3D CT reconstruction of someone with uh, severe claudication and skin changes in the lower extremities. And we could see the abdominal aorta looks fine, and all of a sudden it gets narrowed down to nothing. Uh, and this is the lumen that we're showing here. And that's because of uh, all the placking from atherosclerosis and maybe even some calcification from monk burbs. All right, what's the sequelae of a clogging of the pipes? Well, it's the same sequelae as, as Berger's disease, only it's up higher. 
Um, so you get a progressive downstream uh, arterial insufficiency and skin changes. Usually the farthest away from the clog is affected first. So just like burgers, it affects your toes and feet first. Uh, but maybe your calves and maybe even your thighs could get affected from this because the beaver dam is so much farther upstream. So you get claudication with walking, uh, just pain walking around the activity of daily living pain is just pain you don't go for a walk because that causes pain but pretty soon just walking around the house doing activities of daily living causes pain uh, chronic tissue ischemia skin changes hypertension can occur uh, why would hypertension occur uh, well if your abdominal aorta is all clogged up that's a huge part of the body that is not getting proper oxygenation and the heart will sense signals from that ischemic tissue to pump harder and that's going to raise your blood pressure because you're going to have to pump harder to get through those narrowed that narrowed abdominal aorta so that can cause hypertension let's do a case 55 year old woman comes in complaining of intermittent claudication she used to be able to go with her women's group and walk uh, a mile and not now she can't go more than four blocks and her legs feel like they're running out of power and they get painful. And after the walk, uh, she's sore for a couple days. She has to take painkillers and ibuprofen. Uh, and the pain feels better by putting her, her legs in a position of dependence. So sitting or standing still without movement helps with the pain. Uh, and bending forward over a shopping cart makes no difference. That's shopping cart sign, right? That's NIC. That's neurogenic intermittent claudication. If that one's, if that does help, but if it doesn't help, it's probably VIC, vascular intermittent claudication. Uh, what kind of exam would you do on this patient who presents? Well, inspection. Put her in a gown and look at her gaiter area. Look at her ankles and her feet and her calves and see if if there's skin changes. Um, is there are there brawny indurations? Are there is there telangiectasia, which would mean a venous problem? Um, and then palpate is the skin cold? And what's what's the skin going to look like in this condition? Is it going to be all swollen? No, it's not going to be swollen. A swollen is a block in the venous side causes swelling. It's a backup of blood into the microcirculation. You don't have any problem with getting blood out of the lower extremities. Uh, in pad or Berger's disease. Now the problem is getting blood to the lower extremities. So you're going to have white, pyloric, and even cyanotic looking feet. Cold. When you palpate, they're going to be really cold because you're not getting enough blood. Then you perform Berger's test, capillary refill test, the brachial index test. And those are, if those are all positive, you suspect the, and they're not a smoker, you suspect that they have peripheral arterial disease. Who do you refer the patient to? I always ask that question, or almost always ask it. <clears throat> no, not their general doc won't. I mean, they'll probably know what to do with it, but your primary health care provider are going to be. Who do you refer this patient to? Vascular surgeon. Vascular surgeons see these people. Right, there's just the Berger's test we've talked about, ankle brachial index test we've talked about. All right, so the patient went to a vascular surgeon and they performed a, a 3D CT reconstruction and here's what she looked like. And you can see the aorta is normal size up here, but the further you go down into the abdominal aorta and into the iliac vessels, these are like pencils. They should be way bigger than that. And so these are all filled up with atherosclerotic placking. That's also why she has hypertension. All right, so PAD. Um, are there other causes of PAD? There is a rare cause of PAD uh, called fibromuscular dysplasia, and we're going to talk about that next time. Uh, but basically, it's the tunica media gets really thick and fibrous uh, because of this disease process, and it narrows the lumen. There's no plaque or anything. It's not an atherosclerosis problem, um, but it's a thickening of the lumen of the blood vessel to the point 
or a thickening of the wall of the blood vessel to the point the lumen gets narrowed and now you got yourself a beaver dam. All right, that's enough for your brains. Good luck on that CCP test tomorrow. Um, I will be back uh, later on this afternoon to... Um, I was just noticing. I don't think this is a recording on Virtual Classroom. I'll be back uh, to do the other one this afternoon, the GIGU later this afternoon. All right, bye-bye.